Hello, my name is Dr. Adam Sherakovsky. Today, I'll be talking about blockchain. Firstly, I will give a short introduction to what blockchain is, and then focus on the structure that really distinguishes blockchain from other systems. The key is to use cryptography to ensure the blockchain is safe and secure. And most of the presentation focuses on that. Finally, I will talk about the advantages and disadvantages of using blockchain. List a few examples and then wrap things up. So just a friendly reminder that this presentation does not take into account the investment objectives, financial situation, and advisory needs of any particular person, nor does the information provided constitute investment advice. Under no circumstances should investment be based solely on the information provided. So let's get started talking about what is blockchain. The very short answer is simply that a blockchain is a way to store data. So for a blockchain, this is done by storing the data into blocks and then linking them together into a blockchain. So here's a list of the advantages of using blockchain. So you can have a quick glimpse, but I will be mentioning all of this again at the end of the presentation, when we actually have a better understanding of what blockchain is. So to understand a blockchain, we will need to talk a little bit about cryptography. So broadly speaking, cryptography is all about encryption and decryption of data. However, for the purpose of this presentation, we only need to talk about one special type of encryption called a hash function. So a hash function is a mathematical algorithm that can take any string of symbols and turn that into a fixed length string of symbols. So for example, the most commonly used hash function is called SHA-256 and it can take any string of symbols and turn that into a string of 256 bits. The Bitcoin blockchain uses this technology. Unfortunately, writing a string of 256 bits as a list of zero and ones takes a lot of space on a slide. So equivalently, I will use hexadecimal numbers having 64 digits, where each digit is either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, or F. Confused? Do not worry. While I'm being a little bit technical here, you can think about a hash function in a very simple way. Every text string has a digital fingerprint, also called a hash. And a hash function is simply something that can tell you what that fingerprint is. So let us now have a look at a couple of examples. Firstly, what is the hash of the word apple? Or asking in a bit different way, what is the digital fingerprint of the text string apple? Well, the answer is the string 3A7, BD3, and so on. Here we have the hash of the text string Elon Musk and Elon Husk. We see the digital fingerprints are different. For all practical purposes, each fingerprint is unique, meaning that if you give me two different text strings, such as Elon Musk and Elon Husk, they will have a different hash. If you actually get into the mathematics behind the hash function, it should be possible to find two different text strings that have the same hash. However, with current computing power, it will take more than 10 billion years to find such a pair, and obviously, no such pair has been found. Okay, so with this small introduction into cryptography, we are now ready to build our own blockchain consisting of four blocks. So as you can see, I have already decided what data will be stored in the four blocks. We will now use cryptography to link these blocks together. And we will do this by adding extra data to each block. So let's see how that's done. So the first block is a bit special because this extra information we're adding is just a string of zeros. In fact, this block has a special name, and it's called the Genesis block. Okay, so it might not be immediately obvious why we link the blocks the way we do. However, it will become more apparent when we talk about the safety of a blockchain. With that said, the next step is to compute the hash of the first block. This is done by putting all of the content of the first block into a single text string and then compute the hash of that. So as you can see, the result becomes A97, A13, and so on, ending with 3A9. So the next step is to take the hash of the Genesis block that we just computed and put that into block number one. Having done that, these two blocks are now linked. Okay, let us now link block number one and block number two together. So this is done by computing the hash of block number one and put that into block number two. More specifically, 
we take the content of block number one, which is the hash of the Genesis block, and the text string Tom paid Sam USD2, we put that in a single text string and compute the hash of that. So that gives the result 20 BBC9 and so on, and we take this result and copy that into block number two. Okay, let us now link block number two and block number three together. So this is done by computing the hash of block number two and put the result into block number three. So more specifically, we take the content of block number two, which is the hash of block number one, and the text string Elon Musk. We put that into a single text string and compute the hash of that. So that gives us the result F9AA2 and so on. And we take this result and copy into block number three. As you can see, the only technical part here is being able to find a digital fingerprint of each block. And if you are very curious, I invite you to verify this computation yourself by going on the internet and find an online calculator that allows you to make this computation. Simply search for SHA 256 online calculator. Okay, with that said, we have now built our own safe and secure blockchain. Or have we? Actually, how do we know that this blockchain is safe and secure? Well, Let's have a look at an example and gradually unravel how the safety protocol of a blockchain actually works. So in this example, a hacker gets access to our blockchain and changes USD2 to USD1. Okay, let's have a look at the result and think about it this. Is there a way for us to notice that there is something wrong with the blockchain? Here's a hint. Look at block number one and find a hash of this block. As you can see, that is E09, DD5, and so on. Do you know what the problem is? Well, the problem is that what we just computed does not match the fingerprint safe in block number two. Remember, the number 20BBC9 and so on inside of block two is the hash of block number one. But our most recent computation of this hash gives us something else, namely E09, DD5, and so on. The only explanation for this is that someone has tampered with block number one. Okay, let us now assume that the hacker has the computing power to recalculate the hash of block one and put that in block number two, before we notice anything at all. So to clarify, what is happening here is the hacker firstly takes all of the content of block number one after his malicious change, and secondly computes the digital fingerprint of that and finally puts the result in block number two. So effectively, a hacker is changing both block number one and block number two. Okay, have a look at the result. And once again, think about this. Is there a way for us to notice that there is something wrong with the blockchain? Here's a hint. Look at block number two and find the hash of this block. As you can see, that is FAD 9B3 and so on. Do you know what the problem is? Well. The problem is that what we just computed does not match the fingerprint saved in block number three. Remember, the number F9AA29 and so on in block number three is the hash of block number two. But our most recent computation of this hash gives us something else, namely FAD9B3 and so on. The only explanation for this is that someone has tampered with block number two. Okay. Now let's assume that a hacker has the computation power to recalculate the hash of block one and put that into block two and to recalculate the hash of block two and put that into block number three, effectively changing both block number one, block number two and block number three, exactly as illustrated on the slide. Okay, have a look at the result. and Once again, think about this. Is there a way for us to notice that there is something wrong with the blockchain? So here we actually need the full strength of a blockchain to provide a complete answer. So let's just recap what we have noticed so far. So we have noticed that if the hacker changes something in block number one, then he or she needs to recalculate the hash of that block and the hash of all the following blocks. So the longer the chain, the harder it gets. So this is of course interesting because it begs the question 
What if the hacker only wants to change one of the most recent blocks? Okay, let's have a look at that. So here we consider an example where the hacker changes Elon to Mel. So of course, to keep the chain in proper shape, we need to correct the hash saved in block number three. But that's just one computation. So that could be very doable. Okay, so have a look at the result. And once again, think about this. Is there a way for us to notice that there is something wrong with the blockchain? So in fact, this example is very similar to the one we discussed above. We just made it easier for the hacker, reducing the number of computations he or she needs to make. So in particular, as I alluded to earlier, we need the full strength of the blockchain to provide a complete answer. So let's now have a look at this final piece of the puzzle. So the trick is that a full copy of the blockchain is distributed among several computers. So here I illustrated three such copies, each one located on a separate computer. Actually, let's make that five copies of the blockchain. So I will slightly rearrange things so there is enough space to do this. Okay, we are back to the same question again. Have a look at the blockchain network. And once again, think about this. Is there a way for us to notice that there is something wrong with the blockchain? The answer is this. Looking at the most recent hash in each of the five copies, we can see that one of the copies is different. Why? Well, the last hash in the first copy of the blockchain starts with 8EC, while all the other copies contain a hash starting with F9A. So by a majority vote, the network identifies the faulty blocks and deletes them from the network. Finally, using one of the valid copies on the blockchain, the half-broken copy of the blockchain can be repaired. Now that we know what a blockchain is, let us talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of using a blockchain. So in terms of advantages, the blockchain is typically very open, giving you access to the code running the blockchain. So among other things, you can actually check the code is secure before using the blockchain. It is distributed, referring to the fact that there are several copies of the blockchain on the network, so if one breaks down, it can be restored. It is global, meaning that wherever you are in the world, as long as you have an internet connection, you can access the blockchain. It is flexible. As long as it is digital, you can put almost anything into a blockchain. Some blockchains store healthcare data, transaction data, while others store games or other type of programming code. A blockchain is transparent. You can see the content of every single block on the blockchain. It is inexpensive. A lot of services on a blockchain are offered at a very fair price. This is one of the reasons that El Salvador introduced Bitcoin as legal tender. It is decentralized. There is no single institution or country controlling blockchain. It is for everyone to enjoy. It is secure. The blocks cannot be tampered with by a hacker. The blockchain is also efficient. It can very often remove the middleman, making services speedy and efficient. It has less errors. With increased transparency, errors can be dealt with more efficiently. And finally, a blockchain is fully automated. For example, the transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain do not require any human verification. In terms of disadvantages, some people say that the blockchain technology is very complex and they struggle to understand the blockchain technology. The 51% attack is referring to the situation where a hacker takes control of the majority of a blockchain network but this potentially requires hacking thousands of computers spread across the world and is not considered an issue for all major blockchains. Of course, we never know what kind of regulations a country may impose on the use of various blockchains, so this will remain a risk. For example, use of cryptocurrencies is very restricted in China compared to, for example, US. Some people say that the blockchain technology has not really matured and they do not want to use blockchains for this reason. As another point, errors always occur, and the fact that it is not possible to change the content of a blockchain is seen as a disadvantage by some people. Others are saying that blockchains are very wasteful, referring to the fact that the energy consumption used for the SHA-256 hash computations is quite significant. Also, while many services on a blockchain are often both fast and inexpensive, there are cases where blockchains have not been able to cope with the rapid changes, causing bottlenecks, delays, and higher fees. In many cases, this is really an issue of scalability, 
where blockchain has not been properly designed to be able to cope with a rapidly increasing demand. While the blockchain technology might not be fully matured, the technology is advancing very fast. So for example, the Ethereum blockchain is now being replaced by Ethereum 2 blockchain that is about a thousand times more energy efficient. Here on the final slide, I have listed a couple of major blockchains currently in use. Perhaps the two most known are the Bitcoin blockchain and the Ethereum blockchain, but there are many other blockchains. So one is the Factum blockchain, that is a decentralized publication protocol for building record systems. In summary, after a brief introduction explaining what blockchain is, I formally introduced the cryptographic SHA-256 hash function and explained how it's used to link the blocks together. I then explained how the blockchain uses the distributed network to ensure safety of the blockchain. Finally, I finished up with a discussion of the benefits and shortcomings of using blockchain and mentioned a few examples of existing blockchains. In conclusion, while blockchain technology is still considered by many as being at its early stages of development, it will be very interesting to see how this technology continues to improve and evolve.